Linear transformations on random variables. Let's go back to the beginning of the course when we had a simple variable like the scores on a test. So we had people in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and we hate you. All right, every class has one. So let's suppose the mean average in this class was 78, uh, median was 78.5, standard deviation 10.3, etc. Now check it out. If we added 10, like we curved the test, we added 10 to all the scores, all the scores would move up by 10, but the spread between the scores will not change. So the 78 becomes an 88, the 79 becomes an 89, but the gap between is still 1. The gap between there is still 1, the gap is 1, the gap is 1. So the measures of spread have not changed when we add a constant to all the values of the variable. But the measures of center will increase. The mean and the median will both increase by 10. Now contrast that with multiplying all the scores by 10. If we multiply the scores by 10, the 78 becomes 780. So the new mean is going to be 780. It's 10 times as big. Now the next number over is 790. So the gap used to be 1 between them. Now the gap between these two adjacent scores is 10. So measures of spread also increase when you multiply by a factor. So that's very important to us. Measures of spread will change when you multiply a variable by a number, but measures of spread will not change when you just add something to all the values of the variable because all the scores just shift up. All right, we can show mean of x as the expected value of x, so get used to that nomenclature. Uh, 78, let's suppose the true standard deviation of this distribution of um, of scores was 9 and the variance then would be shown this way or this way and the variance would be 9 squared would be 81. So let's suppose that we're going to transform this random variable x. We're going to multiply all the scores, in this case maybe all the test scores by a value, and then add a certain amount to all the test scores. And we'll call this random variable y. Well if that's the case then this implies that the mean of y would be the mean of this transform variable where every x value was multiplied by 8 and then had 10 added to it. So we'll take the old mean of all the x's of all the test scores, multiply them by whatever factor we're going to multiply by, and then add the result, the constant that we choose to add as well. Now the implication for standard deviation and variance is a little bit different. The standard deviation for y is going to be the standard deviation of this transform random variable, but it's only the multiplier, the factor, that's getting multiplied by the values of the variable that's going to affect the standard deviation. Remember, adding a constant does not affect the spread, the, the standard deviation or the variance. So the new standard deviation would just be the factor A times the old standard deviation of X. The new variance is going to be the square of the new standard deviation, so it's going to be A squared times the variance squared. And a lot of times if you're doing a problem in STAT, instead of memorizing that whatever the multiplier is to get the new variance, you square that and multiply it by the old variance. Most students are fine with that, but if you get tripped up by that, just find the new standard deviation and then square it and you'll automatically find the new variance. So for example, what if we were going to multiply all the scores by 10 and then after that we were going to add 20 to all the scores. Because uh, so, uh, my test scores are all out of 1,000, it's more exciting that way. So let's do this. We're going to take uh, all the scores, so we're going to say the new random variable y, which will be the, the new scores, are going to be 10 times the old scores, the old random variable x, plus 20. So the new mean of y is going to be 10 times the old mean of x, so that's 10 times 78. Remember, if we go down here, I guess... We, I, we should be good and go to this formula down here. But this is going to give us the, uh, the new mean average. So A is 10, so we're going to take 10 times the old mean average, which is 78, and then we're going to add the 20 to all that. So that will give us the new mean, which would be 800. So the new mean average would be 800 for the transformed random variable. Then what's going to happen to the standard deviation? Remember, it's only the multiplier, the 10 that we multiply by, and not the 20 that we add, that's going to affect the spread. So we're going to take the multiplier of 10 
multiply that by the standard deviation of x, which was 9, that's going to give us our new standard deviation of the transformed random variable. That's going to be 90. Like I said, the easiest thing now to get the new variance is just square the new standard deviation. So 90 squared is going to be 8100. If we're not buying it, then all we have to do is recognize, well, a squared, a is 10. So we take 10 squared times the uh, old variance, which was 81. And sure enough, 10 squared times 81 is 8100. So if you're a formula person, go ahead and use, memorize these formulas, I guess, and use them. I would rather we just remember that, hey, you know what? When you multiply a variable by a, a constant, then all the measures of center and the measures of spread get that many times bigger. But when adding a value to a variable, only the measures of center are increased. The measures of spread are not. So however you have to uh, work with it, find either memorizing or, or really understanding the concept, uh, go with that. All right, so let's suppose we have cantaloupes that weigh on average 1.8 pounds with a center deviation of 0.3 pounds. And let's suppose we had a dog, maybe a collie, and its big plan in life was it we was going to run off with an antelope and have babies. So it's going to create a cantaloupe, right? But then when they found out that ain't happening, the cantaloupe or whatever, then it kind of started getting depressed. And for comfort food, it started to eat cantaloupe. Who knew? I'll tell you, man, that's one melancholy dog. But anyway, so here we go. Uh, we're going to take a look. At, uh, at this right here. Now we're going to do a random, uh, a linear transformation on this. Let's suppose that the cantaloupe are selling for two dollars a pound. So the cantaloupe are selling for two dollars a pound. So this distribution is just the weights of the cantaloupes. They could fluctuate. They might, on average, they weigh 1.8 pounds, but with a standard deviation of 0.3, some are a little bit above two pounds, whatever. But we want to now talk about the distribution of the cost of the cantaloupe. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this random variable C, which would be distributed this way, and we're going to multiply it by 2. So now we're saying, oh, we're going to take every cantaloupe and multiply it by $2 to get the cost. So that new cost, if we're multiplying all the cantaloupe weights by 2, what happens to the mean? Remember, it gets multiplied by 2. Does the standard deviation change if we multiply all the weights by $2 to convert to uh, cost? You bet your sweet bippy they do. So here's the deal. The new distribution is just going to be we'll take 2 times the old mean, and we'll take 2 times the old standard deviation. And what we get then is the cost at $2 a pound of these cantaloupe will be normally distributed with a mean of $3.60. That's an expensive and a uh, standard deviation of 2 times uh, um, 0.3, $2 times 0.3, so that would be 60 cents. So that's our new distribution. So if we said, hey, let's find the probability that the cost of a cantaloupe would be greater than $3.50, then we're going to go into this distribution to answer that question. And, uh, and this will be our mean and our standard deviation. Now I want to contrast that with something else. The problem we just did is a linear transformation. We multiplied the one and only cantaloupe we got, if we select one cantaloupe at a time, we're going to multiply that weight by $2 to get the cost of it. So we only selected one cantaloupe, but we multiplied its result, its weight, by 2. That is a linear transformation. And so we multiply the mean by 2 and the standard deviation by 2 to change from weights to dollars in cost. Now, let's compare that to a joint distribution. What if we selected one cantaloupe and then we added another cantaloupe to it? Um, so this would be a joint distribution. And I've got to be careful, this is the state of Colorado, so we just passed uh, the marijuana thing. So that, um, that, that it's, uh, when you start talking joint distributions in this state, you've got to be careful. want to make it clear that we're talking about the uh, two cantaloupe added together, and, uh, and that's going to give us a, a new weight. So here's the deal. If in this, this is a joint distribution where we're adding one plus another, and so the joint distribution, if you recall, is that C plus C, we're going to add the means together, 
1.8 plus 1.8 because we're still dealing with the total weight if we're adding one cantaloupe plus another one. Those are dealing with weights. But now if you recall that the, uh, the new standard deviation for a joint distribution where you're selecting two things and adding them together, you don't get to add the standard deviations together, you have to add the variances together and then take the square root to get it back down to standard deviation. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to add 0.3 squared plus 0.3 squared um, and that is going to be our new standard deviation. So this will be 0.09 plus 0.09. So what's, what that's going to end up being, this is going to be n times 3.6 and this is going to be radical 2 times 0.3 which is about 1.4 times 0.3 which is going to be about 4.2. So it's going to be about maybe, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 0.43 is going to be the new standard deviation. So here's what the deal is. When you take a joint distribution and you add two things together, the standard deviation is found by first taking the variances, adding them together, and then taking the square root. That's going to give us a smaller standard deviation than a linear transformation in this case where we just take one cantaloupe and we multiply it by two. So uh, with a linear transformation, we just take our one and only result, multiply every result by two dollars, and we're gonna get this. So the standard deviation over here is 60 cents. The standard deviation over here is uh, 0.43 pounds. They're two different things, but I hope that makes sense. It's a tough concept. If you take a joint distribution, you add two things together, uh, then the new standard deviation is to add the variances together and take the square root. But if you take a linear transformation, you only selected one thing, one cantaloupe at a time, multiplying it by two dollars, so the mean and the standard deviation get multiplied by two, that gives you a very different standard deviation than if you have a joint distribution. And that's one of the trickiest things in some of these problems. So let's, let's finish up with like the mother of all, uh, joint distributions. Suppose that we have cantaloupe that are normally distributed with this weight and apples that are normally distributed with these, this weight and, and that mean and that standard deviation. And let's suppose we're uh, going to have to buy the cantaloupe for two dollars a pound and the apples for three dollars a pound. Those are some expensive apples. Maybe they're uh, organically grown by elves or something. But that's expensive apples. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to select one of each. One cantaloupe and one apple and we want to find the probability that the sum of the costs would exceed five dollars. So if that's the case, here's the deal. It's a joint distribution ultimately. We're going to select two things. So we're adding two things together, but we first need to do the linear transformation. We need to multiply before we add its order of operations. So the first thing we do is we go up here and we say, okay, wait a sec. Let's get the linear transformation to change weights into cost. So the cost of the cantaloupe is going to be, remember, 3.6. We're just doubling it, $2 times each. So it's $3.60 per cantaloupe plus uh, 60 cents as the standard deviation. Let's go ahead and take that out to the tens place. $3.60 $3 per cantaloupe with a standard deviation of 60 cents. Now if we're going over here to the apples, then let's multiply those first. So every apple selected is going to get multiplied by $3 to change it to cost. So if we look at this linear transformation, uh, $3 per apple is going to cause us to get a normal distribution in the cost of the apples of 3 times this, which is $1.80, and 3 times the 0.2, which is $0.60 cents in standard deviation of that. So we first change the weights to cost because we're talking about the sum of the costs exceeding five dollars. So we first did a linear transformation on both variables. Now we do the joint distribution because now we're going to select one cantaloupe cost and one apple at whatever cost it is and let's find that probably the sum of that of those costs is uh, is exceeding five dollars. So, in the end, the joint distribution we're going to get is $2 times the weight of a cantaloupe plus $3 times the weight of an apple. And so this joint distribution will be normally distributed. We can add the two uh, mean costs together. So $3.60 plus $1.80 is going to give us $5.40. 
and then we can take the, the costs, or I'm sorry, the standard deviations, but remember, we have to add the variances together, so 0 0.6 squared plus 0 0.6 squared, and then we take the square root of that, and that's going to be um, the result that we get for our joint distribution. So now we can go down here, and we can say, all right, we've got, uh, on average, the total cost is $5.40, and we want to find the probability that the sum of our costs exceed $5. So on this joint distribution, $5 is where $2 times our one and only cantaloupe plus $3 times our one and only apple, so it would be lowercase uh, letters, so that's three times lowercase a. Sorry, trust me, it's a lowercase a. Uh, so the sum of that would be more than $5, so we want to find the area under the curve right here. So from that, it wouldn't be too difficult. We'd just find a z-score, we'd take normal CDF, and we would find the area under the curve. I think we're fine with doing normal distributions, and that would be radical 2 times uh, 0.6 anyway. So sorry, that's about 8.5, maybe 0.85 cents or something like that. So anyways, we do a normal CDF at about $5 uh, to a really high number, and then 540 and about maybe uh, 85 cents or whatever and that would give us the area into the curve. So this is about as tough a problem as we get. It is a joint distribution involving two linear transformations. So if you can handle those, you can handle just about anything. And uh, good luck.